inevitable. And I am Iron Man. Welcome to Marketing Murder Mysteries. I am your host, Michael Graham. Joining me as usual is the team from Millennium Agency. Hello, Linda Fanera, CEO and Chief Strategist. Hello, Michael. And hello, sidekick boy wonder Rob Atkinson, Mag Managing Director. Hey, I'm super today. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and by the way, I think we should all acknowledge right now that Rob has Robin as in Batman and Robin, written all over him. So that's kind of sad right there. Advertising and marketing pros see it all the time. Brands getting killed in the marketplace, sometimes due to their own miscalculations, sometimes by events beyond their control, like... A super bug threatening to destroy the world. You know what? The coronavirus should be the plot for Marvel's next summer blockbuster. It's perfect. Think about it. Super virus threatens to destroy humanity and only the Avengers can stop it. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Don't you wish that Iron Man, as opposed to Thanos, could snap his fingers and make this all go away? Superheroes can fight secret Nazi conspiracies. They can defend against alien hordes, but ultimately it was the coronavirus that threatens to silence them all. You're going to hear the case from our marketing detectives, and then you can hand down your own verdict. This week we will discuss, will the coronavirus kill the Marvel brand? So any conversation, Linda and Rob, about the Marvel Comic Universe, the wildly successful multi-billion dollar property, has to start with the key marketing question. Linda, which superhero are you? All right, how about, um, I don't know. The Black, Black Widow. Widow. Black there Widow's you go. <laughs> okay. No, I'm no. a Scarlet Witch. Ah, well, uh, I, I that reflects the power. Never mind. Uh, so, so Rob, how about you? Oh, Spider Man. Uh, isn't it obvious? No, Robin. I'm still. Don't you think, Linda? Definitely. That's DC. Oh my gosh, matter. you guys are killing me. There, there's only one DC character that's worth paying attention to and that's batman everything else is useless and not watchable but i'm not a snob like rob and <laughs> but linda interestingly uh the uh, uh viewing audience tends to be marvel's success is wildly greater you know dc's tried to compete with the Le the uh legion superheroes and with batman versus superman etc they haven't done it the question is what does can either universe can any of these superstar products defeat the coronavirus rob give us a rundown on where the uh marvel slash disney universe of products are in the current coronavirus mess yeah i mean so you know it's important to remember uh with disney and the marvel franchises that all of the movies kind of tie together so you have to roll these out in sequence otherwise they don't make sense when you kind of get to the big ultimate reveal you know, in the last movies, but already they've, uh, they've already uh, adjusted their schedule quite a bit. So they've moved them, the new Eternals movie uh, to February 12th. Uh, Shanghai and the legend of the Tang 10 rings is now May 7th uh, to 2021. Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness is now November 5th, 2021 Thor: love and thunder is now moved to February 18th, 2022. Um, so, you know, and it's even impacting other uh, Disney uh, movies like the live action Mulan remake that they're making. It was supposed to be um, out uh, in uh, this year, July 24th, but it looks like that's going to be delayed until next June, perhaps. Um, so it's really having quite a dramatic impact on the schedule. The most the most uh, the, the, the most current one that everyone's talking about, of course, is uh, is a. Uh, is the Black Widow movie, which was scheduled to come out um, later in April, early May. And now that has been pushed back to Thanksgiving. Well, that's because I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, so here's my question, Linda. We'll start with two things. One is, 
what should a company that has a regular schedule, whether in this case it's the entertainment world, but there are other things as well, like there are festivals that occur every year and people expect them and they set their calendar. Now they're just not going to happen. You don't want to lose your place on people's marketing menu, right? On that list of right. things I need to do, things I need to walk, things I need to tr track. Isn't that a danger during coronavirus time that while companies are uh, locking down, the s people's lives go on and you may lose your place? Right. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how these theaters deal with this pandemic. I mean, I guess from one perspective, they can decide, all right, let's say we'll fill this theater up 50 percent or we'll fill it up 25 percent. But maybe they'll start to look at different schedules. Maybe they'll run these around the clock or take a look at other strategies that allow, you know, people to continue to come see the movies when they when they when they plan to. Otherwise, obviously, we know it will have an impact on their revenues. It will have an impact on anyone else participating. So it, it should be quite interesting to see how this all plays out. Do we know, Rob, what kind of impact the coronavirus is having on the film industry from a revenue standpoint? All right. The revenue question. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, last year, studios took in about $11 billion at the box office. And studios take in about 60% of that. And the rest goes to the theater, which usually, you know, break even with things like the ticket sales and popcorn and soda. Um, so far this year, it's been tragic, obviously, because they haven't been able to show a movie in the last month. Uh, over four weeks and counting, um, that is going to be uh, difficult for them to catch up. And it's predicted to be the worst season since the last economic recession, which is in 2008, 2009, of course. Um, so, Linda, let me ask you this from a marketing standpoint. How do you convince people after watching, you know, tens of thousands of folks die from the coronavirus and, and tens of hundreds of thousands made ill? that you want them to come sit in a room with a bunch of strangers to do anything, much less to do something that they can do at home with their own TV. Oh, it, it, this is, this will be a very interesting way of doing business. I mean, we know now that <clears throat> telework is, is hot. Online education is, is hot and streaming video has gone like through the roof. But, you know, you take a look at these movie theaters and schools that have had to close and trans transfer into online learning and also these traditional workplaces having to close their doors. I mean, everyone will really have to take a, a very close look at the way they do business and possibly come up with other ways to do business. And that, as you know already, many companies have shifted to Zoom, using Zoom for online conferences, changing their events to online events and so on and so forth. And I think that this industry will have to come up with a new strategy and a new pricing tactic. And it will be interesting to see how this all rolls out. So Rob, what are some of the strategies that uh, the movie theaters might uh, go to and that could be models for other businesses whose business model is based on getting a bunch of people in the same place? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of strategies you can do. So, um, for example, you can offer incentives to go to the movie, like free popcorn. Although I'm not sure I want to. Although I'm not sure I want to eat popcorn out of a trough where a 15 year old is perhaps sneezing in right now. But but that's one idea. Uh, or free sodas, maybe. Maybe that's a little bit safer. Um, you can also develop custom offerings that celebrate the lockdown being lifted. Um, two for one deals, for example. You can also develop loyalty and membership programs to the movies. So you get like a movie card and you get discounts on if you go to like 10 movies, which we've seen success in um, in the past. And then the other obvious one is really just to partner with other brands. So movie theaters are the perfect example of this. So with a movie theater, you could do targeted promotions around Disney releases like the Marvel movies. And so there's a lot of opportunities for that. But, you know, I think the bigger problem, though, Michael, is first, it, it's almost a twofold problem, right? So you've got the studio's problem about producing the movies and getting getting it out there. But the second problem is a local level where the movie theaters have to communicate to their customers what the new norm is like to go see a movie. Um, yesterday, uh, recently, there was a uh, an article uh uh, published about from the third largest movie theater chain in America talking about they're only going to have 50% of their theaters are going to be 
um, a lot of people to go in and watch a movie now. And, you know, that's going to be really interesting for people to get their heads around because you're going to have to wait longer to see a movie. Uh, you may have to wear a mask when you're in a movie. And all of these things need to be communicated to your customers before they can even go back and enjoy um, things like movies. Um, so someone understands you're saying they're only going to open half their theaters, but what about the theaters themselves? Are no, half just... of it. I'm sorry. The theaters themselves are going to open. Only half of the seats will be sold. Right. Forgive me. For yes. So Linda, um, the question I have is who goes to movie theaters? Obviously, uh, you know, couples, dates, kids, the teen audience, et cetera, that's very important. What kind of mom is going to be ready to have their teens go to the movie theater you know, where, you know, and sit next to a bunch of other sticky, sweaty, smelly teens who are, you know, bouncing <laughs> germs off of each other. Uh, and so are there, are there marketing messages? Is, is this, is this something that marketing can solve, can be a part of? Does it have to be a change in policy, a combination? What? Yeah, I think, I think it's going to have to be a, um, a combination. I mean, if you take a look at, um, like NBC universal, for example, and, and some of these other, um, other companies, they're actually experimenting with a pay-per-view model that just actually allows a consumer to take a look at uh, videos that are new, that take, watch videos in their home, you know, sort of prior to that release and charging a premium for that. So it might be a uh, 20 bucks for a 48 hour rental, but they'd have to use it through iTunes or some, or Amazon prime. So I think they'll be coming up with tactics like that, which means that the marketing needs to support that. So what are we doing to bring movies to homes early on or previews of movies early on? These are some new things that they're going to have to take a look at. They're going to have to pilot. They're going to have to find out what's working, what's not working. And it's just a whole nother way of tackling this. I worry that no one's ever going to leave their house again and we're all <laughs> going to be overweight, drinking, and... <laughs> And um, <laughs> depressed. So I think um, I think that these are some of the other things that they're, you know, they're taking a look at is how can we address this? Um, you know, how can we address business during this pandemic? You know, you right. say those th what? things about being drunk and overweight like they're bad things. I don't understand. I am getting a little used to it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's interesting. Also, a lot of theater uh, chains are experimenting with. Um, re-releasing classic movies like Star Wars again or Rocky and going having a new round of, of moviegoers enjoy that those classic films in the theater experience because a lot of the big budget Hollywood movies that are scheduled to go out are still about gun shy about putting it out right away um, and they want to see how that new norm settles out before they start releasing some of these big flicks because there's just so much money uh, online here. And you also mentioned the idea of doing um, a special like end of lockdown showing. So I can't mm -hmm. wait to, I can't wait to see Shawshank Redemption and uh, the great escape <laughs> right. showing right. a double bill <laughs> down at the Bijou. <laughs> You know, the other I, thing, I too, is movie theater, drive-in theaters, right? Maybe drive-ins are going to make a comeback now, right? Because then we can all stay in our car. We can watch the movies, <laughs> you know. It's going to open the door. It's going to be back wow, to the future. That's right. No pun that's intended. Right. No. <laughs> and, and by the way, you both missed the best uh, superpower to have is teleporting. So you need to be a Nightcrawler from the X-Men and teleport, except you have to live as a freak who's purple. So that's a problem, but you yeah, got to take the good with the bad. So that's, that's, uh, that's it. And there you have it. Uh, has the coronavirus killed the Marvel cinematic universe and the entire cinema industry along with it? The case has been made and now it's time for you to give your verdict. Let us know your thoughts at mill.agency forward slash verdict or slide into our DMS on Twitter at mill agency. We'll read the best ones in a future episode. Make sure to never miss a mystery by subscribing to us on Apple podcast, Google play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or your podcatcher of choice for Rob and Linda. I am Michael Graham, and we will see you next time until then the case is closed. Mm -hmm.